Good afternoon, this is Pamela, and you are listening to Watchmen on the Pod. Today, we are going to go through something that the Lord has been opening up to me for a little over a week now, I believe it is. And uh, I, I do urge each and every one that has a Bible to open up your Bible, follow along with me, first and foremost. Um, secondly, if you do not have a Bible, then there is Bible Hub, there is um, Blue Letter Bible, there's so many different Bibles that you can get online. Also, like I have suggested before, I, I, I highly recommend eSword. It is a free download that you can download either on your phone or on your laptop. And on this eSword, I mean, you can get, I can't, I don't even know how many Bibles. I mean, I'm looking right here. I've got so many different Bibles downloaded and then commentaries, a lot of commentaries. And then the dictionaries that help you understand the Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Aramaic. And then you've got editors where you can do journal notes, study notes, topical notes. Then on top of all of that, they also have um, tools to where you can look at a graphic viewer. Um, you can look at maps, a whole bunch of things. And then they also have a... Uh, Oh, what is that? A link, I guess you should say, to t sermon audio. So you can listen to uh, some men that are teaching on the Word of God. You know, always be careful who you listen to, but I just want to give that, put that out there. So anyway, today, what we are going to be studying on is Moses and also the Lord Jesus. Things he opened up to me that I did not know. I did not know. Now, years ago, he had opened up to me that Jesus had been, they had placed three different colored robes on him. And I understood that. And then I had understood that he was beaten at least twice, but he was beaten three times. And prayerfully through the precious Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, can bring this all together to where it will make sense. But as I said, make sure you have the Word of God open and you are following along. Um, we are going to start with Moses so we can understand exactly what took place out in the wilderness when he did what he did. Now, question, how many times did Moses strike a rock and bring forth water? And what does strike mean in the Hebrew? Exodus 17, 5 and 6. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Take it in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee, there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, for the people may drink, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. That right there was one time Moses hit a rock, and water came forth. Now go to Numbers chapter 20. We're going to start in verse 7. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother. And speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. And so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he had commanded him. <clears throat> and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock and said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and with his rod, he smote the rock twice, 
and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because, and said, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Moses hit that rock twice. For a total of three times, Moses smote a rock and water came forth. Now, he was only to hit the rock once, which was the first time in the book of Exodus. The second time, he was supposed to speak to it. But instead, he hit it twice. And like I said, that's for a total of three times. Now, if we go ahead and go back and look at Exodus, we will find that it was Moses and Aaron, right? And who? The elders of Israel. Where he smote the river and he says, take that rod and go. And then before the elders of Israel, Moses did that in their sight when he hit the rock. That's important. Now in Numbers, it wasn't just the elders of Israel that he smote this rock twice, but it was in front of the entire congregation. That's important. Now, we're going to go to Strong's, and the reason we're going to go to Strong's is we need to understand what does smiting the rock, smoting the rock, what, what does that mean in Hebrew? Now, the word to pronounce it is naka, naka. It's a verb, so it's an action. And it means to smite, slay, kill, Beat, slaughter, stricken, give, wounded, strike, stripes, stripes. All right. To strike, smite, hit, beat, slay. To be stricken or smitten. Um... To chastise, send judgment upon, punish, destroy, to smite. Um, a primitive root, to strike lightly or severely, literally or figuratively, beat, cast forth, clap, give wounds, go forward, indeed, kill, make slaughter, murderer, punish, slaughter, slay, smite, smiting strike, be stricken, give stripes, surely wound. That is what it meant when Moses hit that rock three times. One time was in front of the elders. The other time was in front of the entire congregation. But the rock was hit struck, given stripes three times. Now, who is the rock according to scripture throughout the Old Testament and also in the New Testament confirms it? All I really need is to read the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 to see exactly who the rock is. But I enjoy taking many scriptures together and allowing them to interpret one another. So I just pulled out a few scriptures in Deuteronomy 32, which is the song of Moses. And then I pulled out other scriptures to continue to interpret the, let the word interpret the word. Okay. In verse four, it says, he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right 
is he. Verse 13. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock, and oil out of the flinty rock. Verse 15. But Jeshron waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Verse 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Number 30. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except the rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? Verse 31. For their rock, little r, is not as our rock, capital R, even our enemies themselves being judges. Verse 37, And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock, in whom they trusted? Little r. Moses' death foretold because of striking the rock and not speaking to it in verse 48 through 52. And the Lord spake unto Moses that selfsame day, saying, Get thee up into this mountain, Abram, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho. And behold, the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession. And die in the mount whither thou goest up, and be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hor, and was gathered unto his people. Because ye trans trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, because ye sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel, yet thou shalt see the land before thee, but Thou shalt not go thither unto the land which I give the children of Israel. Now what we read here was <clears throat> many verses telling us, and this is through Moses' own mouth. This is the song of Moses. He realized who that rock was that he struck and water came forth. He was told and he knows what he had done was wrong. The first time he was told to smite that rock in front of the elders. The second time he was told to speak it forth. And that water would come forth. He was not supposed to hit the rock, let alone twice. Moses knew, according to his song right there, who the rock was. The rock was God. Psalms. 118 verse 22 the stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner psalm 18 verse 2 the lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my god my strength in whom i will trust my buckler the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Psalm 61 verse 2 From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Verse 3, 61 3 for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. Psalms chapter 62 verse 2. 
He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. And there's I've got many here written down, but I'm gonna but I'm just gonna read a couple of more from the Old Testament and then go straight to the New Testament, okay? okay. Um in First Samuel, <laughs> it was thinking that's funny. Okay, First Samuel chapter two, verse two. This was uh, Hannah speaking when she was praying, and uh, she was saying, "There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside Thee. Neither is there any rock like our God." Um, in Isaiah chapter twenty-eight, verse sixteen. This is um, this one scripture here is confirmed over and over and over so many times. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a pressure cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Romans chapter 9 verse 33. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. First Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now, Jesus is talking in Matthew twenty one forty four, and says, Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. Matthew 7, 4, 24 and 25. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken un him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Your foundation, brothers and sisters, and mine, and the apostles, is the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, the rock of our salvation. So, without a doubt, Scripture tells us very clearly, the rock, the chief cornerstone, the stone of offense, is God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to take you back to the law in Deuteronomy chapter 25. And I had only written one verse, chapter, uh, verse 3, but I'm going to go from chapter, I mean from verse 1 to 3, so you see the overall picture of this. De Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 1. If there be a controversy between men and they shall, and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them. Then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And it shall be, 
if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face according to his fault by a certain number. This verse right here is very important. Verse 3. Forty stripes he may give him and not exceed, lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. Now, you need to understand what all of this means when it comes to what Moses had done. First, we're going to read some prophecies telling us concerning Jesus, the beatings, the mockings, and the scourgings. And yes, that is plural. Jesus endured three different times of being scourged, being beaten with a whip. Uh, flag on or a f I think it's called flagellus three times three times all right so let's go to the prophecies and we will start in Isaiah chapter 50 verse 6 I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now, the word despise in the Strong's is baza, baza. And that means contempt, despicable, despised, disdained contemptible, think to scorn, a vile person. So as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 3, 40 stripes he may give him and not exceed, lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. So there it was, they're watching, and they say right there in Isaiah, he was despised, vile, and we esteemed him not. Those are prophecies written about Jesus. Verse 4 says, Surely, he hath borne our griefs, which is sicknesses, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. For sorrows in the Hebrew means pain. He carried our pain. In the Hebrew, the word is makab. Almost sounds like you know, what is it, like a horror movie, macabre or whatever? It really kind of does, doesn't it? Macabre, pain, um, sorrow, sorrow, sufferings, painful. Um, in verse 5 it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Bruised in Hebrew is daka, and that means to crush. Become contrite, contrite, crush, crushed, crushing, oppressed. 
beat to pieces, hmm. break in pieces, bruise, contrite, crush, destroy, humble. That is what it means where it says he was bruised. It means to crush into pieces. And that's exactly what happened to our Lord and Savior. Number seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. <clears throat> Excuse me, oppressed in the Hebrew is nagos. And it means to press, drive, oppress, exact. Um, like a taskmaster would. Drive hard. Afflicted is anna in the Hebrew. And it's defile. To be bowed down or afflicted. Now, all of that does have a purpose behind it. You need to understand that all of this was written a four time before Jesus was born, obviously. <clears throat> a lot of the prophecies that you will read is in Isaiah. Isaiah really, really focuses on the suffering servant, but so does the book Psalms. Also Psalms 22. I mean, Psalms 22 starts out with my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then it also describes on how Jesus was to be killed. And it's talking about his hands and his feet being pierced, but no bones of his body being broken. Praise God. Now, I want you to go back and reread Exodus 17, 5 and 6, and then Numbers chapter 20, 7, I believe it is, it starts, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah, 7 through 13, 13. Refresh your memory on where it speaks about Moses. The first rock he was told to smite, to strike, <laughs> to beat. The first one was in front of the elders. Okay, that's important. <clears throat> I told you it was important and I'm going to show you why now. Go to, I got to come back on down because I got my notes. I got my notes on the computer. With the arthritis, it's hard for me to actually sit and write and I very rarely ever write anything anymore. I type everything out by one finger. And uh, so it's on my, what is this called? What is this thing called that I use? Word? I think that's what it's called. Word or something like that. Anyway, we are going to go and we are going to go first to John chapter 18. And we're going to go through and show you, we, huh, we, and I'm talking like I'm multiple people here, but the Holy Spirit is here. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus was first taken to Annas who had been a high priest and was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was now acting high priest, okay? I do not understand as of yet the importance of being taken to Annas first. I really don't. I can't even assume on that. I do not know. But I do believe there is an important reason unbeknown to me at this point on why. But John chapter 18, starting at verse 12. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus. So many times we get the idea, and I think it's from movies and also from lack of study, obviously, that we thought it was a whole group of Roman soldiers going to go get Jesus at the garden. That's not true. That No, no, that's not the word. That No, 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 no. Romans had nothing to do with the arrest of Jesus. Read it again. Then the band and the captains and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, 
for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now, Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. He prophesied this. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whether the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, <clears throat> Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. Think about that. So here it is. He went to Annas first. Annas like, you know, tell us about your disciples. You know, tell us about your, your doctrine. Trying to ensnare him. And also to expose the names of his disciples. Who, who are those 12 following you? What are their names? What is the doctrine? You tell us. And, you know, and Jesus is like, I have not taught anything in secret. Everything I said was open. So why don't you ask the people what they heard, what I taught them? Well, that officer which stood by Jesus struck him, it says, and with the palm of his hand. So basically slapped him. And then they bound him up or kept him bound, I should say, and sent him on to Caiaphas. Now, Jesus was not beaten there at Caiaphas. That's important because, see, this, all of this was an illegal trial, by the way. I hope people understand that. It was never to be done in the middle of the night and never to be done in secret. No, no. Shame, shame, shame. No, 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 no. They broke their own law. They did. But anyway, so after Annas, Jesus is taken to Caiaphas for an illegal trial where he is brutally beaten. That is where it begins, right there. The brutality begins. And we are going to look into Mark chapter 14. <clears throat> Starting at verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest which is Caiaphas. Now, for some reason, I don't know why, but in Luke, I believe it is, he also calls um, Annas the high priest, but he also calls Caiaphas the high priest. I don't know if it's like, you know, how we do the presidents or whatever, where, you know, right now, Joe Biden is the president-elect. Uh, Donald Trump is the acting president, but Obama was president at one time too. So we still call them president. I don't know if that is why, because Annas was not acting high priest anymore, but he is referred to as high priest, just to, you know, clarify that up. So here we go. And with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And Peter followed him afar off even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. And the chief priest and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. So one would say one thing, another one would contradict what he had just said. And so it was all lies they were saying, but they couldn't get two to agree on the lie. But they soon do. And there arose certain and bare false witness against him, saying, We heard him say 
I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither did, but neither so did their witness agree. And when the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and buffet him and to buffet him and to say unto him, Prophesy! And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. Let's keep going. We're going to Matthew 26. Line upon line, precept upon precept. I probably got that backwards. <laughs> okay, so Matthew 26, starting at verse 57. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace, and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses, and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God, and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose, and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered, and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tellest us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard this blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him. You got to stop it there for a minute. Did they spit in his face and buffeted him? That is a semicolon after. That could have been a period, and then it could have went on to a different sentence. You've got to understand that. That is very important. I didn't realize how important this stuff was, especially when I was going to school. But now I understand. So that could have been a period, and they could have just continued with another sentence. Okay? But so what they did instead was they put a semicolon. And it says, And others smote him with the palms of their hands, of the palms of their hands, and then they said, let's see, saying, prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Stop there. Go to Luke chapter 22. We're going to start at verse 63. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things 
blasphemously spake they against him. Now, this is important. Why is this important? We've got three Gospels that's telling us from Mark, John, was it three or is it even four? Let's see. We've got John 18, talking about when they took him to Annas, remember? The officer slapped him with the palm of his hand, so just slapped him in the face. Then they sent him on his way to Caiaphas. And we see where in Caiaphas they get really angry, and it was an illegal trial. So we read about that, and then we read about the same time with him and Mark. So we got John, Mark, and then we got Matthew here telling us about him going before Caiaphas, and then in Luke. You got to piece these all together to get the entire picture. Luke is the one, even though it's just a few scriptures, is the one that's telling us it all right there. What I mean by this. Luke twenty-two sixty-three says, And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. Period. What? What does that mean? They smote him? Where it says they smote him, it was not a simple, backhanded slap. Look up the word in Strong's. It's called dero, to skin, to thrash, fillet, flog, scourge, beat, receive lashes hits, smite. Right there, in and before all the elders of Israel, the judges, Jesus was found guilty and there they smote him. They scourged him. Let's not forget, and we're going to go right back to it. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 3. Forty stripes he may give him and not exceed, lest he should exceed and beat him above these many stripes. Then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. Think about that. Now, who was to do this? Remember verse 1. If there be a controversy between men and they come unto the judgment, the judges may judge them. Who are the judges that would sit in the gate? It was the elders of Israel. As time went on after Babylon and stuff, then you had the Sanhedrin made up. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the elders, all sat there as judges. Now, in the middle of the night, an illegal trial, they tried Jesus. And they determined he is guilty of death. But they cannot kill him, remember? But they can scourge him. They can beat him. Now, <clears throat> In Deuteronomy, it tells us that God allows 40 stripes, but no more. Because if they beat him with any more, then he would basically be disfigured and he would look pretty vile. Now, I had to go back and I had to look up. I wanted to know and understand for myself, Father, am I really hearing from you on this or am I just reading things in there that's not in there because I, I do not want to add to the Word of God I do not want to take away from the Word of God I want the Word of God to interpret the Word of God and that's that's just it so here's Moses is told in Exodus I want you to hit that rock and water's gonna come forth and it happened that right there was a picture of Jesus Christ being beaten that is what God allowed. He did allow it. He also put it in Deuteronomy 25, how many lashes that would be allowed 
considering the severity from the lowest to the highest, the highest being no more than 40. We read that, we see that. Now, according to tradition, which, you know, we are not to be traditional people. We are to go according to the word of God and not by hearsay. But a lot of people, they, they like to misquote and go by tradition. They'll say, well, they only beat people 39 stripes instead of 40, just in case. Well, you know, I can understand that because Apostle Paul, he was beaten, remember, five times by the Jews, it says. Get it right. Not the Romans. By the Jews, he was beaten five times. 40 stripes save one. 39 times. All five times. They did that just in case they miscounted, they said. And so they would only beat them 39 stripes. Now, this right here is a thing that I had looked up. And it's in the Jewish Virtual Library. And it is on flogging. Not the Romans, but the Jews. The flogging and his punishment by beating or whipping. This at all times has been the instinctive way to inflict disciplinary punishment. A parent disciplines his son by beating him. And you can see the cross references. I'm not going to read them to you, but the cross references is Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18. Proverbs 19, verse 18. Chapter 23, verses 13 through 14. Chapter 29, verse 17. And as does a master his slave, so a, a master will be to slave. And that's in Exodus chapter 21 verse 20 and verse 26 that's the flogging more than any other punishment flogging is a means of correction rather than retribution and being a substitute for the capital punishment which in the rabbinic view every violator of god's word properly deserves it reflects god's infinite mercy so God says, flog them 40 times. The rabbis says this is a substitute for capital punishment, which is death, right? But in the rabbinic view, in their eyes, every violator of God's word should die. That's how they feel. So, so you can just imagine the hatred they had for the Lord Jesus. Now, biblical, the biblical law. It appears that where no other punishment was expressly prescribed, flogging was in biblical law the standard punishment for all offenses. And that's in Deuteronomy 25, and they're stating verse 2. Um, let's see. Let me go on down, and it says, oh, one minute, I have a phone call, so let me pause just for a second. Okay, sorry about that. Nikki had called and I had to take that phone call. So sometimes I hate that because I get so sidetracked. Okay, <laughs> so I was reading from in the biblical law. Oh, I see where I was at. I am so sorry. I do apologize. All right, it is noteworthy that flogging is the only punishment mentioned in the Bible as a general rule and not in relation to any particular offense. Deuteronomy 22 is a cross-reference regarding post-mortem hangings. See also capital punishment. The only exception being the flogging prescribed in addition to a fine for the slanderer of a virgin. And that is when somebody rapes a woman. And that's in Deuteronomy 22.18. Now, they have misquoted here. Deuteronomy 25.3 because they said the max. Well, let's see. How is it worded? <clears throat> excuse me, the maximum number of strokes to be administered in any one case is 40. Lest being flogged further to excess, your brother is degraded before your eyes. While this number was later understood as the standard fixed number of strokes to be administered in each case, less one. 
there is no valid reason to assume that it was not in fact intended and regarded as a maximum limited, the preceding words, as his guilt warrants. And that was in 25 verse 2, indicating that the number of strokes was to be determined in each individual case according to the gravity of the offense, provided only they did not exceed the prescribed maximum. The scriptural intention to prevent any degradation of the human person is served by the fact that no discretion was allowed to the judges who may tend to harshness or cruelty. There is no record of the manner in which floggings were administered in biblical times. Excuse me. Various instruments of beatings are mentioned in the Bible. Excuse me. Cross references are Judges chapter 8, verse 7 and verse 16, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 13, and chapter 26, verse 3, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 11 and 14. But any conclusion that they, <clears throat> excuse me, or any of them were the instrument used in judicial floggings is unwarranted. Now, said all that because according to their law, when it says that they had smote Jesus, let me go back to it because I don't want you to think I'm adding anything to it. We're going back to Luke chapter 22 verses 63 through 65 and the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him and when they had blindfolded him they struck him on the face and asked him saying prophesy who is it that smote thee and many other things blasphemously spake they against him. They mocked him, smote him, stopped. Then they blindfolded him and they struck him on the face. You must see that. Right there, they whooped him. They beat him. They scourged him according to the law. That is the first time Jesus was beaten. That was the time that God had allowed. You see, you got to understand, it had to happen. That was as when Moses went in Exodus, took the elders and smote the rock and water came forth. That was the only time God had intended for Jesus to be beaten. But Moses, in his heated anger, disobedience, instead of speaking to the other rock, he hit it two times. For a total of three times, Jesus would be beaten. And I will show you through scripture. So let's keep going here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I had wrote on here, and I had put some more strong so you could understand, where it says they smote him. Like I said, it was not a simple backhanded slap. It meant to flay, flog, scourge, beat, to skin, to thrash. Have you ever heard, like in old movies, or, you know, you may have heard your grandparents say it. It all depends, I guess, on how old you are. Because I, I don't think they say these things these days, but I remember hearing them. I'm going to skin you alive, or I'm going to skin your hide. Well, I mean beat. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you. Well, we get that word through the Hebrew here. Beat, smite, flay, to scourge, thrash, skin. Now, to strike with the fist, that word is kol af edzo, kol af edzo. I'm probably definitely not saying that right. And that's to strike with the fist. I strike with the fist. Buffet, hence, I mistreat violently. 
so as a violent blow. Properly to strike with the fist, literally nickel, knuckles, to hit hard with the knuckles, to make the blow sting and crush. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, the idea is striking with something sharp and painful, sticking deep in the flesh so it remains. And that is where Pastor Paul speaks about Satan had uh, brought, oh, how's that word? A messenger of Satan to buffet him. You remember, and he had sought the Lord three times, and God finally said, my grace is sufficient for you, and he did not remove that thorn in the flesh. He did not. All right. Now, what they had done at the illegal trial at night was the beginning. It was only the beginning of Isaiah 14. By the time he was hung on the tree, Jesus was no longer recognizable as a person. You need to understand that. I mean, I, I, can, I cannot press this harder yeah, I can. I guess I can because, see, you, you need to understand. Isaiah, and let me get it on the Bible here rather than uh, going back up and down, up and down on my computer. That is one big mess when that happens. I wish, well, if there's no sense in wishing, I pray that this awful arthritis will go away to where I can actually write things out by my hand again. But, you know, sometimes we are so lazy. Hold on. I've gotten this all mixed up here. Oh, let's see the beginning. Isaiah 53. Surely he hath borne our griefs, sicknesses, don't forget that, and carried our pain, it's a sorrow, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So here it is. They thought God was all in this beating and God. Inadvertently he was because it had to happen. It was supposed to happen, but not the second time. So here we go. According to the law, he was to be beaten, scourged with 40 stripes upon being found guilty. The illegal trial that was held before the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, being the judges, being the elders of Israel, as Moses was commanded to take with him when he smote the rock. Let's not forget, Apostle Paul tells us that that rock was the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was the water that they drank. Now, Isaiah... Um, Let's see. Isaiah fifty three fourteen is that correct? I don't think that is correct. I think it is should be fifty two fourteen. Let me make sure so I don't misquote. Yes, it's fifty two fourteen, and it says, "As many were astounded at thee, his visage was so marred, more than any man, that his form." and his form more than the sons of men. Now, I had to look it up again and say, all right, Lord, what are you saying here? Okay, so I went to the Strongs again to look up some words so I can understand completely what it is saying to us. The first word I looked up was astounded. And that um, is the word shamim. And that is to be desolated or appalled. So, is astounded, astonished, become desolated, causes horror. Think about that. So, here it was. Let's go back and reread. As many were astounded, horrified. Think about it. At thee. So they were horrified to even look at Jesus after all that. Then marred. I looked that up, and that's in the Strong's Concordance. And that is Mishkoth, and that is corruption, disfigurement of face. Disfigurement of face. 
Now his face, visage, is, uh, how do you pronounce that? Mare, and his sight, appearance, vision. So it's everything that we would thought. You know, it is his face, his visage, right? And then his body, his form, is the outline form. And that word is Torah, Torah, Toar, Toar. And that is, you know, his, his body, his appearance. And let's go back. We're going to go back to the scripture to reread it so we know what we're talking about. As many were horrified, astounded at thee. His visage, his face was so disfigured, marred, more than any man. And his form, more than the sons of men. Even his body was disfigured horribly horrible thing to look at then in Isaiah 50 uh, chapter 50 verse 6 it says I gave my back to the smiters comma it's not a semicolon so it's continuing what was happened or what is going to happen and what did happen I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair I hid not my face from shame and spitting. That verse right there happened at Caiaphas's palace before all the elders, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, right there. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. That right there for full, 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 I'm sorry, I can't even talk because I get so excited. But the fulfillment of that is John 18, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. We see it all if you piece it all together. That was the first beating. That was just the first beating. That was the one that God ordained. That was the one that God allowed. That was the only one that was supposed to to take place that was the only one that was supposed to take place now we're going to continue Jesus before Pilate we're going to start in Luke chapter 23 starting at verse 1 the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. So after he was beaten, after he had been had his hair from his face, his beard pulled out, he was spit upon, all of that. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the King. They flat out lied. They flat out lied. Remember when they had come, and Jesus says, whose inscription is that on that coin? And they said, Caesar. And he says, render under Caesar what is Caesar's, and under God what is God's. And remember he sent Peter down to the water and said the fish that comes open its mouth and inside is a coin you go pay our taxes yeah uh-huh no they lied they lied all right verse 3 and Pilate asked him saying art thou the king of the Jews and he answered him and said thou sayest it then Pilate said to the chief priests and to the people I find no fault in this man and they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him in many words, but he answered 
nothing. The chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. I'm going to stop there. The reason I'm going to stop there is you need to see. All right. Now, I had read this one man. <clears throat> I do not know where he sees it or anything like that, but he had said that he was beaten there. I don't read that. I, I do not. I do not read that at all. I read where, and Herod with his men of war said him at naught. They kind of like, well, if you look up the word naught, you're going to find that it, he, nothingness, he means nothing. He's, he's, he's nothing. When Jesus wouldn't answer him or wouldn't perform, you know, like a court gesture, basically, he was tired of him. And so what they did was, in order to not waste the visit, I suppose, they mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. Now, you need to understand something. And I and I, I am going to stress this. I'm not appealing to your emotions. I'm I'm not caring about your emotions. To be perfectly honest with you, that's one of the reasons why I do not care for the passion of the Christ. So many people were overwhelmed emotionally that it really did nothing to their spirit. I don't care. I'm not here to appeal to your heart. I'm not here to appeal to your emotions. I'm here to tell you the truth of what happened that day. Now, Jesus had already been beaten, scourged, thrashed, skinned. Remember, we read it. By the judges, the Sanhedrin, in front of the high priest. So his flesh was already opened. Now, he sent to Pilate, Pilate finds out, wait a minute, you know what, he's not my problem, he's a Galilean, send him over to Herod, you know, whew, thank God I don't have to, you know, be concerned about this, this issue any longer, at least that's what he was thinking, right? So here's Herod, now remember, Jesus called Herod a fox, that is a very derogatory, big time derogatory, remark that he had made of Herod, Herod was a feminine, sissified, man, it shows in history, that he was also a pedophile, not of girls. Many people back in that era did not molest girls. No, they molested young little boys. Herod was no different. He was a little fox. He was a filthy, filthy, wicked man. And he would sit there in his glorious apparel all of his jewelry, be so feminine and all this stuff. And he wanted Jesus to do tricks. And Jesus was not about to do anything for that sly little fox. Now, so what they did was they had tore off Jesus's clothing that he had because Jesus had his own robe. Let's never forget that. Jesus had a garment. No, it didn't cost him a dime. Now, we can get into this just for a minute. That garment that was without seam, that a lot of ministers tried to prove that Jesus had money, he wore designer clothing. No, he did not. He wore the clothing that the Jewish mother would make for her son as he was leaving the home to go into life on his own. It was usually, believe it or not, blue. Hmm, imagine that, but we'll keep going. So they tore off his clothing, not ripped it, but you know, just removed it from him, put upon him a gorgeous robe. And if you look that up in Strong's, you will find it's called Lampros, bright. And that means shining, magnificent, bright, splendid, clear, fine, gorgeous, shining, bright. Then you keep going down here and you will read and it renders. Some interpreters following the Vulgate understand white apparel 
to be spoken of in Luke 23:11. That's what we just read. That robe was white. That robe represented purity, holiness, righteousness. They robed Jesus with a white, gorgeous robe that represented his holiness, his purity, his righteousness. Now, verse 12, And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him. And lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For of a necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. And they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that he should be as they required, that it should be as they required. And he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Now that's in Luke chapter 23. Now we're going to go back to John chapter 18 starting at verse 28. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early and they themselves went not into the judgment hall lest they should be defiled, that they, may, might, that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a male factor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, 
that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find him no fault at all. But ye have a custom, that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Now I have this in here and you need to understand the reason being, I know there's a lot of interjects and stuff like this. There's a lot. And what I'm going to do my very best if possible, because this is 27 pages of notes that I have. Um, I'm going to do my best to put it on Watchmen on the pod. At least I'm not going to be able to do it on YouTube because you're only allowed it. So, so many words. So obviously 27 pages is too much. So the judgment hall is the same as what is called a praetorium, okay? It is the official residence of a governor. The palace at Jerusalem occupied the Roman governor of the quarters of the praetorium guard in Rome. Uh, praetorian, properly a governor's house, um, official residence of a government, governor, so you need to understand that. So it was right there at Pilate's is the Judgment Hall, which is the Predatorium that they had taken Jesus to. Now, here is what I found very fascinating. Very, very fascinating, to say the least. We are going to start uh, chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe. Now I'm going to stop there at the purple robe because we're going to go and we're going to find out. So when the Romans scourged a man, what did that consist of? That is very important. So right here, we're going to history, Bible history, Roman scourge instrument. And that's what we're going to start off talking about. <clears throat> a, Roman, a Roman flagrum, which was designed to quickly remove the flesh from the body of a victim. The Romans would, according to custom, scourge a condemned criminal before he was put to death. The Roman scourge, also called the flagrum or the flagium, uh, flagellum, flagellum, was a short whip made of two or three leather, ox hide thongs or ropes connected to a handle as in which is a sketch there's a picture above the leather thongs were knotted with a number of small pieces of metal usually zinc and iron attached at various intervals scourging would quickly remove the skin according to history the punishment of a slave was particularly dreadful. The leather was knotted with bones or heavy indented pieces of bronze. Now I'm reading this from Bible History Maps Images Archaeology dot com. Sometimes the Roman scourge contained a hook at the end and was given the terrifying name scorpion. The criminal was made to stoop, which would make deeper lashes from the shoulders to the waist. According to Jewish law, discipline of the synagogue, the number of stripes was 40 less one, 
which that, that that's misquoting because it's not 40 less one. It was 40, but no more. That's Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 3. Let's not forget that. And the rabbis reckoned 168 actions to be punished by scourging before the judges. Nevertheless, scourging among the Romans was a more severe form of punishment, and there was no legal limit to the number of blows. As with the Jews, deep lacerations, torn flesh, exposed muscles, and excessive bleeding would leave the criminal half dead. Death was often the result of this cruel form of punishment, though it was necessary to keep the criminal alive to be brought to public subjugation, subjection, subjugation on the cross. The centurion in charge would order the licitors to halt the flogging when the criminal was near death. Isaiah 53, 5 through 6. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah chapter 53, 5 and 6. Now, the flagellum, I'm, I'm sure I'm saying that all wrong, is a symbol of soul, S-O-L. And it was on an ancient Roman coin. The flagellum is the symbol of soul, the sun, God. In ancient Rome, crucifixion was almost always preceded by the flagrum. And thus it made the vision of the crucified criminals all the more dreadful. Cicero called crucifixion the extreme and ultimate punishment of slaves and the cruelest and most disgusting penalty. And Josephus called it the most pitiful of deaths. Jo uh, Jewish Wars, chapter 7, I'm assuming it's verse 203. Isaiah 50 and 6, I gave my back to those who beat me my cheeks to those who plucked my beard, my face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. 52.14, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. Yes, yes. Now, Mark fifteen fifteen it says, So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released to them Barabbas, and Jesus he scourged and delivered to be crucified. I'm going to stop there because I just wanted you to see for yourself how the Romans did the scourging versus how the Jews did the scourging. But I still want to point out the fact that this right here is the second beating Jesus endured. It's the second. So let's continue with our study here. Now, it says, Then Pilate, this is John 19, 1, Therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe purple robe. This is very important. Purple in the Strong's is, as I probably can't say this right, but I'm going to try. Porphorus. Porphorus. Purple. A purple, reddish purple cloth or dye. It was customary in ancient times for a king to dress in purple. Hence, 
giving Jesus a purple cloak, mocked him as someone merely posing to be a king. This garment was perhaps a discarded officer's cloak that had been dyed purple. It was purple. I'm going to say it again. It was purple. So, now we have Jesus over at Herod's place was put on a white, glorious, beautiful robe which represented Jesus' holiness, purity, righteousness. Now, here's Pilate's soldiers putting upon him a purple robe which represented his divinity not his divinity but his kingship he was king of kings lord of lords clothed him in a purple robe now each time they would put on him just like i had said that they had took off jesus own garment the one piece garment in order to put the glorious robe on him after they removed the glorious robe you got to think what's happening with the human body that robe would have been like a, uh, well, even with before the robe, Jesus' blue garment that he had, that they had cast lots for at the, at the end of the cross, the foot of the cross there. When they had removed that from him, he had opened wounds. By removing that, it would be like moving, uh, removing a bandage off of an open womb and reopening it. Then they put on him the beautiful white robe. Now that is acting as a bandage, right? Then when they remove that, that tore them open once again. I mean, I just, I can't, I can't stress to you that you understand that Jesus did all of this for us. But some of this was not in God's plans, but because Moses disobeyed and did not do as God had told him to do it had to happen it had to happen you need to understand that God didn't just get angry and not allow Moses to go into the promised land over something that would have been forgiven disobedience is forgiven but it is as the sin of witchcraft we need to understand that because that is what rebellion is is disobedience but it was much more severe than what we are being taught. It's because that rock represented Jesus and he was just supposed to speak to it. He did not. He smote it twice, which meant Jesus would have to be beaten three times instead of once. And so Moses was not allowed to go in to the promised land. Though he did get to see it from afar off, he got to peer into it. But he was not allowed to lead those people into the promised land because of what he had done. So let's keep reading. Now, verse 19, and not verse 19, but chapter 19, verse 3, and said, Hail, king of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, excuse me, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. So when Pilate brought Jesus forth, he had already been scourged. He's wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe in front of everybody. And it says, And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, what did they see? They seen here Jesus beaten. Now, he's, he's looking pretty rough, children, because he was already beaten by the judges over there, the Sanhedrin, during that illegal trial. And now he's beaten by Pilate. Well, not by Pilate himself, but by the soldiers, right? 
So he he's he's looking pretty bad. He's looking rough. He's he he's pretty bad because he's had his beard pulled out. He's had his face beaten. Remember, with the knuckles bare, beating him violently. He, you know, he's been spit upon. He's been scorched at least by forty stripes from the Sanhedrin, and who knows how many these soldiers just did with those bone chips and the copper and all that other stuff. That hook that was like the scorpion peeling the flesh off of him now he's before the high priest the chief priest and all that and they cry out crucify him crucify him they have no compassion whatsoever seeing jesus mutilated before them they still cry out crucify him crucify him pilate saith unto them Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. And that is in verse 6, chapter 19 of John. Keep going, chapter uh, verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that, saying, He was the more afraid, and when he get into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? And Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were, gi for, except it were given thee from above therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin and from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him but the Jews cried out saying if thou let this man go thou art not Caesar's friend whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar when Pilate therefore heard that saying he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The priest answered, The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Now we are going to go to Mark chapter 15. This is Mark's perspective, but it all goes along with John's right there. You need to see how it goes, it corresponds with the two. 15 verse 1 and straightway in the morning of the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate and Pilate asked him art thou the king of the Jews and he answered and said unto him thou sayest it the chief priest accused him of many things but he answered nothing and Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witnessed against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. The multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What well, will ye then that I should do unto him who ye call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. 
Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called the Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. Now I told you what the Praetorium meant. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon his head and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe from him, and put on his own clothes, and led him out to be crucified. Now, as I said, the purple in the Strong's and Coordinates is porphora, pophora, purple fish, purple dye, purple cloth, a purple garment indicating power or wealth. The Thayer Greek lexicon, the purple fish, a species of shellfish or mussel, that's there, would get the purple dye, just like Lydia that Apostle Paul speaks about. She was um, a lady that did purple dye. Now, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 27 starting with verse 1 when the morning was come all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death and when they had bound him they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor and Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. The crowd chooses Barabbas. Verse 15, now at the feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And when, and they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have you have nothing, nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Now, Look at this, read it, reread it, and read it again. I'm not even kidding. You need to understand. Matthew 27, 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a torment was made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. 
Verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. They stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Stop there. Strong's Concordance, scarlet. Kokinos, kokinos, scarlet. Crimson, scarlet, dyed with Kermes, kokum, the female cocos of the Kermes oak. Scarlet, crimson. It is not purple. It is not white. It is crimson, blood color red. Now, 29. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Now, Common Hall, look that up. It is a tract of ground, the use of which is not appropriated to an individual, but belongs to the public or to a number. Thus, we apply the word to an open ground or space in a highway reserved for public use. Why is this important? Why is this important? I'm going to tell you why. Where we read in Numbers, where Moses, he took the rod, as God told him to take the rock, speak to the rock. Moses didn't speak to the rock in Numbers. No. What did Moses do? What did Moses do? Go to verse 11. Verse 11. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank and their beasts. Now, he had done this in the eyes of the congregation. And by him doing that, he defamed God. He, he, did not, he did not obey God. He rebelled against God. In the heat of anger, Many of us are guilty of that. I know that we are because, you know, people be just nitpicking and just constantly, you know, tearing away at us and we just, oh, and then we blow. We can't do that. We can't do that. Moses did that. But see, he was supposed to speak to it. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded and he gathered the congregation together before the rock. Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he smote the rock twice. Now, go back to John chapter 19. You got to see this. If you don't see this, and I have failed. Chapter 19. I'm going down to it myself right now. Verse 1. Okay, chapter 19. Verse 1. How do I skip around like that? Sometimes I just don't know. <laughs> All right. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus. Now when did he do this? 
Remember, in chapter 18, they're saying, Barabbas, we want Barabbas, we want Barabbas. They're crying out, right? Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber, it says. Then Pilate, therefore, took Jesus and scourged him. The soldiers plated a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple, purple robe. And said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came forth, then Jesus came forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold, the man and then you've got the dialogue back and forth crucify him crucify him we have no king but caesar you know if you don't crucify him you know you're an enemy of caesar's and going on and on and on and on and on right and then you got mark that goes along with what Pilate would was doing and stuff and then it says and then it says and so Pilate willing to content the people Release Barabbas unto them and deliver Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. So we got that. And I was talking about in the Praetorium, which is the judgment hall, which is part of the governor's place, which is Pilate. Pilate was the governor in Judea at that time. So then you go on down, you keep reading, you keep reading, and you're finding, wait a minute, wait a minute. Matthew doesn't line up with them. He's not lining up at all because Jesus was already beaten, already mocked, stood before everybody basically as a joke because they were mocking him. He had that purple robe on. He had a crown of thorns on his head. He was mutilated, disfigured, and they're crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate doesn't know what to do. He really don't want involved in this issue at all, but he's got to because he is the governor of Rome at that time. So he's got to execute the law and do what they say when it comes to who is going to be released for that feast. The whole point is he had been beaten. He was in a purple robe. He had a crown of thorns on him all before the congregation. That's one strike. Second strike. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tollment was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of this just of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then now we're in twenty seven, Matthew verse 25 then answered all the people and said his blood be on us and on our children then released he Barabbas unto them and when he had scourged Jesus he delivered him to be crucified verse 27 then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. Now it sounds like, wait a minute, that, that sounds like what we just read in Mark. It's not. It's not. Read it slowly. Read it carefully. Study it out. Two different times. And gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And as I showed you, scarlet, that came from an insect, not a fish. Purple came from the fish. The scarlet came from an insect. And when they had plated a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him, and then they took the reed and smote him on the head. So they're hitting the crown of thorns, making it go deeper inside of his head, right? But they took him 
to the common hall, the common hall, the judgment hall, the praetorium, not the same. Common hall is not the same as the other two. The other two are the same because on the outside of the judgment hall was the judgment seat that Pilate sat in after he washed his hands and says, I'm, I'm innocent of this man's blood. I am. Right? And then he sat down. This is the common hall, another area which belongs to the public. So once again, he was beaten before the congregation. That, my brothers and sisters, is the word of God. You either accept it, you reject it, you can disagree, but that's how I read it. I've not added one thing to it. I have not taken one thing away from it. I dare not do that. I fear God way too much. But one night, last week I think it was, it kept going over and over and over in my head. I don't know why. I'm not going to call it a dream. I'm certainly not going to call it a vision. I didn't see anything. It was just these words, Moses, three times, the rock. And I was like, what are you saying? I mean, in my head, this, in my sleep, this is happening. And it's like, what is going on? What is going on? So I got up the next day and it's like, all right, Lord. All right. Well, I remember when I had done the study and I had wrote the book on the cross. I remember seeing the three robes, you know, and oh, I forgot to even tell you. I'm sorry. The scarlet robe represented his sacrifice, the blood without the shedding of blood. There is no remission of sin. All right, his blue garment that his mama would have made him before he went out into the world represented heaven. Blue represents heaven. Now, if you look at all of those colored robes, clothes that Jesus had on represents what? Do you understand it? You need to understand it. The veil, the veil of the tent of tabernacle in the wilderness. It was blue. It was red. It was purple. It was white. And then guess what? It was blue again. That's how it was designed to be. And that's exactly how. Oh, praise God. These garments was placed on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. It also says that his flesh was the veil. And because it was torn for us, we have access to go boldly before the throne of grace. It is only by and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, whole point of this being is they are not preaching the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not preaching the crucifixion as it happened. I don't know about you, but you know what? Basically, all of my life, I've always thought it was the Romans that beat Jesus. I never even thought about it or even imagined that the Jews were participant in it, but they were. They were the first ones to beat Jesus with 40 stripes. They pulled his beard from his face to where flesh from his face would have just dangled. They spit upon him. They hit him with their knuckles and stuff. After they were done abusing him and mocking him, they sent him to Pilate. Pilate, when he realizes, hey, wait a minute, he's a Galilean. I don't have to worry about it. Take him to Herod. Then Herod, who wanted Jesus to be like a court jester, a joker, he wanted him to perform a miracle and to talk to him and stuff. Jesus did neither. He got upset, but then he says, well, we'll just, we'll just make fun of him ourselves." Puts on a beautiful white, beautiful, gorgeous robe, mocks him, makes fun, sends him back to Pilate. Pilate and Herod becomes friends who were enmities at that time. Now they're friends because they got a common factor there, which is Jesus the Christ. Then after that, Pilate beats Jesus. Well, not himself, but his soldiers. They played a crown of thorns upon him, puts a purple robe on him, mocks him, makes fun, yada, yada, then takes him out before all, before the congregation shows. Here it is. Here's your king. 
What should I do with him? And they get angry instead of feeling pity or sorrow. They get more angry and they're saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate's like, you know what? You guys are messed up. I see nothing wrong with this man. So he goes over, he washes his hands and let it be known. I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Let it be known to all. They're saying, let his blood be on us and on our children crucify him he must die and so then turn around it says that he that he lets them have barabbas and then it says he scourges jesus again the soldiers then take him into the common hall they put upon him a scarlet robe they beat him again they plated another crown of thorns. They used the reed that they had put into his right hand. They took it out of his right hand and beat the crown of thorns into his head even deeper. And then they did this in front of the congregation. Afterward, they removed that robe once again, put his clothes on him, and then led him to Calvary. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you better be careful being disobedient. You better be careful letting your anger get away with you. You know, being angry is not so much the sin because it says in the word of God, be ye angry, but sin not. Jesus was angry. Yes, he was. When he went into the father's house and he seen that they had made it a den of thieves instead of a house of prayer, he was angry. He himself plated a scourge, a thread, and then he went around, but he did not beat man. There's people saying that he was beating men and women. No, he was not. He was beating the tables. He was expressing his anger, but he was not sinning in any way, shape, or form. He did not sin. We need to realize that and understand it. But Moses did. Moses, he got angry because the people would not shut up. They kept complaining. They kept whispering. They kept murmuring. And they were saying, you brought us out here to die of starvation and of thirst and our beasts also. And he was like, must I? And he got mad. And instead of speaking to the rock like the Father in heaven told him to, he hit the rock twice. And then out came an abundance of water to satisfy the thirst of the men, women, and animals. But because of his disobedience, Jesus had to be beaten three times instead of once. And Moses was not allowed to take the children into the promised land because of his disobedience. We must be very sure and count the cost before we decide to say, Father, I'm going to follow you. Because if you do not count that cost and in the middle, having your hand to the plow and you begin to look back, you are not fit for the kingdom. And trust me, your disobedience will be judged. Do you have any idea if God has told you to go and say something to a complete stranger on the street and you say, oh, I can't do that. I don't know that person. I don't know what they'd say. And you go on and that person gets in their car and they die. But you could have told them about the Lord as God had prompted you to go do, but you did not think about it. I want you to understand it is so very serious. If you are sold out for Christ, you better be sold out completely and totally 100% surrender all that you are, your money, your health, your wealth, everything that you are, your pride, everything that you are and give it all to him and say, whatever you say, I will do because we must be about the father's business in this year, 2020. It's about ready to come to a close. And Jesus said he came to say what he 
that sent me tells me to say, I come to do what he that sent me to do. I come to do the will of my father. If you notice and you need to understand, reread those gospels, you will find there was people that Jesus passed every single day, but did not heal them. Why? Why didn't he heal them? Because the father did not tell him to heal them. How do I know that for a fact? Because I know Peter and John had went afterward after the day of Pentecost and they went in through the gate called beautiful and there was one that was sitting there every single day of his life for over 40 years at that asking alms of men and women that went inside that was the gate that Jesus had to go through many a time so we passed this man but not once did he heal this man but at that day Peter noticed this man, and he said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise up and walk. And that man was instantly healed. Jesus had passed by him because the Father did not say, You heal him. There was also a time that Jesus went into his city, and it says the multitude. There was a multitude of sick, but there was one and one alone that Jesus healed. The rest he did not. Why? Because the father did not tell him to go heal the multitude, but he told him to heal the one. You need to have your ears tuned in to what the spirit is saying. It says in the word of God, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying. Do not tell me that God does not speak today because he is the same God as he was in the Old Testament. He is the same God that was in the New Testament. He is the same God today. He changeth not. There's not even a shadow of turning when it comes to God Almighty. Let me tell you that right now. He is the beginning and he is the ending. He is the Alpha and he is the Omega. He is the first and he is the last and he is everything in between. He does not change. He is the same. Yes, he may not speak from an audible voice in a thunder. He may not even speak in an audible voice out loud in your ear, but he will speak through the Holy Spirit that he has given each and every one of us. If if we just hear what the Spirit is saying, you need to understand the Word of God is quick and powerful, and it is very sharp. It hurts going in, it hurts coming out. That's what a devil-edged sword will do. It will cut you going in, and it will cut you and tear you up going out. But it is something that we are given in order to use to defend and also use as offensive when we have to. You need to know the word of God. Stand upon the word of God. Do not let anyone influence you in false doctrine whatsoever. Do not let anyone add anything to the word of God in your ear. If they begin to add things to the word of God or begin to say, I know what the Bible says, but this is what God told me, or this is the dream that God gave me. If anything contradicts the word of God, run, 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 run as fast as you can away from those heretics because they are nothing but wolves in sheep's clothing. God will not contradict Predict his word in any way, shape, or form. You are to search the word to make sure what I say to you is truth. Search it. It's going to take you a while. It took me a while, but it may not even take you a while. You go to the father and say, Father, what Pam is saying, is this true? Show me in your word. Is this the truth? And he will show you. And if I am wrong, I, I, am, I just implore you, write me. Tell me, you got it wrong, sister. This is what the Lord says. And you show me in the word of God. I would rather be corrected, rebuked, and reproved rather than you sitting there afraid to hurt my feelings and me go to hell because I had taught something that is wrong or contrary to the word of God. I covet being corrected. I covet being rebuked. I covet it because you know what? That tells me you love me. You love me. And I know that the father loves me. And if I am saying anything that is not of him, I'm asking you, I'm begging you, make sure you write me and you show me and you tell me. Now I'm going to leave it off there. And I want you all to know I love each and every one of you. And I'm asking you to always keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep your nose in the book, which is the word of God. And embed 
the word of God upon the tablets of your hearts so you and I will not sin against God. I know I got a little excited there. I'm sorry for that. I don't know why sometimes that happens, but I get extremely passionate when it comes to the word of God. I get extremely passionate when I hear people say such foolishness by saying, I know what the Bible says, but this is what he told me. Well, then you're hearing a different voice because you test that spirit and you're going to find it does not line up with the word of God. God will not, will not contradict his word. It even says in the word of God that he exalts his word even above his name. And we know that Jesus Christ has the name above all names. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, go to the word. And like I said, I will absolutely put this on the website, my notes and stuff. So you will have the scriptures to go back and forth, back and forth, read it, study it, pray over it, seek God's face. It says in the word of God, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and he will give it to every man freely and upbraid if not. So you know, you got a promise right there. We lack wisdom. Go to the father. He will give it to us. I'm going to close because this is an awful long recording. So you might want to take it in sections. I love you all so very, very much. You have a good day. God bless you, brothers and sisters.